Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Twitter's user numbers decline, and the company warns stagnant growth will continue into this quarter. And how do Twitter's rocky results fit into the rest of the bad news we've seen from Facebook and more? We'll talk about whether tech will fall out of favor with investors. Plus, we'll hear from the CEO of NXP after the deal with Qualcomm fell apart. Is there an upside to moving past the nearly two-year-long saga? But first to our top story, after a promising turnaround, investors are hitting the brakes on Twitter after disappointing second quarter results. Shares tumbled at Friday's open as monthly active users, a key metric, declined. CEO Jack Dorsey talked about what's going on behind the scenes on the conference call. Take a listen. We do see health as a growth vector for us over the long term. Um, and as you stated, we don't think that this work uh, will necessarily ever, ever be done. It doesn't have an endpoint. It's one of those things like security or privacy, where you constantly have to evolve. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Tech's Selena Wang, who covers Twitter for us. And on the phone, we have Ben Schachter, senior internet analyst at Macquarie, who's got a neutral rating on this stock. Selena, if I remember correctly, Twitter's CFO, when news of these account purges started happening, tweeted that this wouldn't materially affect user growth. But it has. I mean, user numbers have declined. At this point, Twitter on a regular basis is deleting a vast number of accounts and the numbers of tens of millions and only a small fraction of that are part of its user metrics. But as we saw from this quarter, it is in fact impacting the monthly active users. Now, the good news here is that after years of criticism, Jack Dorsey and Twitter are finally prioritizing security and health. But that does come at the expense of some short term metrics and Wall Street's happiness. Uh, there were, however, some bright spots to this earnings results. As second quarter revenue and profit blew past expectations. Daily active user growth also continued double digit growth for the seventh consecutive quarter. However, the question is, we all know that improving safety on the platform is good for the long term growth. But at what point is that actually going to help growth instead of hampering it? Right. Daily active users up 11 percent year over year, but they actually don't release the, the actual number of daily active users. Uh, ben, you know, what's your take? You know, are, are you positive or negative here? No, we're still pretty cautious on the name. We, we downgraded it about two weeks ago, anticipating some of these problems. And, and I think the real issue here is there's health, there's the SMS contracts, um, there's GDPR. But the fact is there's just not a lot of compelling reasons that are currently driving new users to Twitter. That's what we see as the key problem. The irony is you've got President Trump tweeting multiple times a day. I mean, if anything was going to widen Twitter to a more general audience, wouldn't that be it? Right, man. It's one of the things I, I pointed out now for, for quite some time is you have the world's most recognizable person essentially using this as his main communication tool, and that hasn't driven more usage. That's a real problem. I mean, particularly if you look in the U.S., where users actually uh, seem like they're going down, if you can't have the president, who is a polarizing figure one way or another, you know, if he can't drive more usage, what would? That, that's what we, we struggle with, sort of. You can do all these things to clean up the network. You can do uh, things that we think are actually important to do, and I think it does help the users that are there. But the challenge is, why should someone new come to Twitter? And so far, we haven't seen a lot of compelling reasons, and I don't see that for the foreseeable future. Selena, you talked to several analysts who actually think this is good over the long term. It will improve Twitter standing with regulators and improve Twitter standing with advertisers who actually want to reach high-quality users, not just any users, and certainly not fake users. Tell us about that. Absolutely. Getting in front of this fake news problem, the bot problem, the fake account problem is very important to tell regulators and show them that they do have this under control and that they don't need stronger regulations that will hamper their revenue in the long term. Now, on the bright side, executives did say that these changes would not affect revenue and that it's only impacting monthly active users at this point. I have spoken to a number of advertisers who are interested in spending more on the platform now that they know that the quality of the users on the other side actually seeing their advertisers advertisements are more legitimate mm -hmm. and more real so in that sense for the long term this is absolutely a good thing but we did see user growth very slow in the United States we saw revenue only uptick 10 percent while internationally it grew 44 percent so now increasingly Twitter is relying on international emerging market growth to bolster its advertising revenue so Ben you know in your view you know 
it's still growing, uh, at least on the revenue side, if internationally. What does Twitter become? I mean, is this just, do we just have to think about this as a different kind of stock? Well, yeah, I mean, I think when the company first went public, everyone sort of positioned it as this big number three player behind Google and Facebook, and that it was going to be the number three ad platform. And I think what's, what's happening is the company actually is moderating its ambitions quite some. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's the, probably the, the right thing for the company. Um, but at only about 335 million uh, MAUs and about less than 70 million in the U.S., you know, it's just not that big relative to Facebook. It's still a very good company. It's still a very large company. But when you're talking about relative to Facebook, which has 2.5 billion MAUs across its platforms, it's relatively small. So I, I think it can continue to do what it's doing well. I think it can continue to improve its product. I just don't see it getting that much bigger in terms of its total addressable audience. Selena, talk to us about how Twitter is attempting to reach that broader audience. They've got the Explore tab. They're curating content around breaking news and around things like the World Cup. But it, it's, it doesn't seem to be working. It, it may be enjoyable for current Twitter users, but it's not attracting new users. That's Twitter's ever-ending problem, is how do they make it interesting for people outside of that core base of politicians, journalists like you and me, public figures, investors, and they still haven't quite solved that question. Now, we did see the World Cup draw in an additional $30 million of revenue just in the second quarter, but that hasn't proved whether or not it can actually draw in new users and have a consistent user base. So at this point, I think investors really just need to reset their expectations. This is always going to be a niche platform in comparison to a Facebook, in comparison to a Google. And Twitter's opportunity at, at this point probably isn't to get 300 some million monthly active users to 600 or a billion, is to try to get those daily active users, those monthly active users that are already daily active users to become daily active users. So they need to focus on extracting more revenue from the same existing base of users. And yet, Ben, it's hard to uh, deny that Twitter has a pretty impactful uh, influence on, you know, world conversation. You've got Bob Mueller now looking at the president's tweets for evidence in his special investigation. You've got President Trump um, wading into this controversy about shadow banning and, and Republican candidates. You know, does that add anything to the value of Twitter? I mean, I think no one will dispute that Twitter is a very important property, but the New York Times is quite important as well, and yet if you look at the valuations on that versus, say, Facebook, obviously there's no comparison. So I think that's part of the challenge here. It, it's a very useful site. I personally use it every single day, multiple times a day. Many people I know do so as well. The challenge is, can they grow from here in terms of um, engaging more new people? And there, they've really struggled, and I just don't see an answer to how they're going to do that. All right, Ben Schachter of Macquarie, Bloomberg, Selena Wang. We journalists certainly enjoy talking to each other on Twitter, but obviously they have more work to do. All right, investor Steve Eisman made famous from the movie The Big Short tells Bloomberg he is shorting Tesla for its negative cash flow and other, quote, execution problems. Elon Musk is a very, very smart man, but there are a mm -hmm. lot of smart people in this world, and being smart is not enough. You've got to execute. And... He's got execution problems. I mean, we'll see how his quarter mm -hmm. how his quarter goes. But you know, his his negative cash flow, as you said, he's building cars in a tent, and um, right, he's nowhere in autonomous driving, as far as I can tell. And and big competition is coming in his space next year. Investors and analysts will be paying close attention to Tesla's cash position and spending when it reports earnings on Wednesday as will we. Coming up, so close yet so far, we'll hear from NXP CEO Rich Clemmer, Rick Clemmer on what's next for the company after Qualcomm pulled the plug on its takeover bid. After a nearly two-year saga, Qualcomm has pulled the plug on its bid to buy NXP. This after the Chinese government let a key deadline lapse, never saying whether it would or wouldn't approve what would have been the biggest deal in chip history. But is the deal officially dead? Here's what NXP president and CEO Rick Clemmer had to say about that on Bloomberg Markets Balance of Power Friday. 
The transaction's complete, it's ended. We've received the breakup feedback from uh, Qualcomm. We're focused on the future and how we can drive true shareholder value for our shareholders. Well, and we want to focus on the future and where you're going and where yeah. NXP is going. But before we do that, just a moment on the past. What got us to this past? From your point of view, you were inside it. What really killed this deal? And to what extent do you actually blame Qualcomm because they got CFIUS involved in the Broadcom deal? Yeah, you know, I think that it, that had nothing to do with the approval in China. I think it could have created a little confusion potentially. There was nothing by the regulations or issues that China could identify that couldn't be resolved associated with the transaction. So it has to be political or some other reason. It's not about the transaction itself. So to that point, if it's not about this specific transaction, and if it is political or has to do with trade issues or tariff issues, what does that say about any deal involving semiconductors going forward now? Is there any other deal that would get approval? You know, I don't, I can't answer that question. That's not something that I'm really in a position to really respond to. I think when you think about it, it certainly raises questions. Uh, you know, there has been a few uh, transactions that have been approved recently. You know, Bain's uh, purchase of Toshiba as well as uh, Marvell's purchase of Cavium. For some reason, they chose not to approve this transaction. And, you know, for us, it's about how we move forward. And moving forward, Qualcomm, for example, had legal disputes with Apple and Samsung as well. How's your relationship with them now? You know, our relationship with Qualcomm is fine. I think it's good. You know, they, they there would have been a huge opportunity to create the semiconductor industry powerhouse going forward, but we don't have that now. So for us, we have a bright future. Our, we're the leading semiconductor supplier into the automotive industry, really focused on bringing technology to make driving safer. We p facilitate the ability to drive connected devices, which is going to be 75 billion by 2025, triple what it is today. And we provide that unique technology to go from low-end microcontrollers all the way through applications processors to be able to use the machine learning and artificial intelligence to put it to work. How much does it help your future that the president actually gave ZTE a lifeline? Well, you know, ZTE is an important customer for us. Uh, you know, last quarter, because the U.S. government had blocked it, we lost about $31 billion of, uh, $31 million of potential sales. So it is a significant customer and one that we uh, continue to uh, want to work with. So you wouldn't have done this Qualcomm deal if you didn't think it was going to grow your company faster, better. Now, that's yeah. not going to happen. So how are you going to grow it faster and better? And specifically, what are you going to do with the $5 billion cash that you're walking away with? Well, we're walking away with $2 billion. Oh, sorry, $2 billion. Uh, And we're actually repurchasing shares. We announced a share repurchase of about $5 billion. We'll use some of that uh, breakup fee to be able to expand our internal capacity. What we're really focused on is how we drive growth and, and drive a leadership position in automotive, making driving safer. We're in a unique position to be able to do that. Our, our uh, leadership across the board in microcontrollers as well as radar solutions really facilitates that and makes driving safer. Our connectivity platforms drives the Internet of Things and the ability to put information to use that, you know, everybody talks about the cloud, but the cloud captures information. You got to be able to put it to use. And our microcontrollers allow you to take that information that comes out of the artificial intelligence and machine learning and put it to use and make it effective. What happens to uh, those micro microcontrollers and also the driving revenue if auto tariffs are in fact put in place? Because the Commerce Department is still investigating uh, those auto parts as national security threats. You know, it, it I don't think it's about a national security threat. It's about you know balancing trade. I, we we're hopeful that free trade will uh, be the rule that will come out of this. We think it's there's more opportunity for it. I think there's still a demand for automotive production. If you look at the growth and where it's really taking place significantly, it's in China and Southeast Asia. So you know clearly we think that's going to take place. China is specifically talking about electric vehicles, and we've actually moved some of our technology where we can support a significant share of the electric vehicle market we hadn't planned on a couple of years ago. So that offers a significant opportunity for NXP. Where in your list of strategic possibilities is doing a deal for NXP, a different deal, either as a buyer or a seller? Should we be expecting NXP to be back in the market either as a buyer or a seller? I think we'll do some acquisitions of tuck-ins that we need for technology to drive solutions. A merger of equals, you know, we did Prescale three years or so ago, and that was more of a merger of equals. Qualcomm would have driven a huge industry powerhouse, but we're really focused on how we can drive the future 
future and how we can make a difference for all of our customers. Well, speaking of driving the future, which may be a pun in some ways when it comes yeah. to autonomous vehicles, right? Driving the future, there is a perception, maybe it's wrong, that we need bigger, we need scale to really move into this world. We see this in other industries as there's a disruption because of digital. Is that wrong? Do we not need scale in semiconductors? You know, I think that it is. It's important to have the technology. The technology is really the critical thing. If you look at the semiconductor content in a car on the average basis, it's going to go up 3x in the next uh, six or seven years. We want to be sure that we can provide those solutions as we are today with the customers to be able to provide that so that they can make cars safer. You don't have as many accidents. You reduce the number of accidents. You improve, you reduce the pollution aspects associated with it, and you provide the security to ensure that it's safer. That was NXP CEO Rick Clemmer speaking earlier on Bloomberg Television. Joining me now to discuss Bloomberg's Asia Tech Managing Editor Peter Elstrom. And as a reminder, the Chinese government didn't not approve this deal, but they didn't actually approve it either. I just let that deadline expire. Now Chinese regulators are out with a statement saying they regret Qualcomm pulling this deal, right. which is rich with irony, isn't it? It's, it's puzzling. I think it's a very Chinese way of asserting their power and influence in this particular sphere. You're right. They didn't outright block the deal, but they knew what the deadline was for the two companies, and they didn't act in time uh, to actually allow the deal to proceed during that time. And so the statement came out last night. It came out from the regulator responsible for approving this, and they said that uh, they regret that the two companies decided to walk away from the deal. They said that their deadline was actually later in the fall and that they had planned to continue to review it. So it, it is an assertion of power by China in this sphere, and it's a very interesting one. I mean, just one step back, why is China even involved in approving this deal, right? It's a, an American company buying a European company. But remember, the tech supply chain now runs through China. These chips are shipped into China, they're manufactured and put into products, and that's the reason that China is able to assert its um, regulatory authority on deals like this one. And in this case, you saw that they are willing to assert that for domestic reasons. China, uh, China has been concerned about the high prices of Qualcomm chips in particular in, uh, in smartphones. And so they're demonstrating that they have influence in this area and that could have a chilling, will have a chilling effect on chips deals. Well, and it's certainly up to Rick Klemmer, the CEO of NXP, to go out there and talk about now how they have a strong future as an independent company. But is the deal officially dead? Could this still happen? Well, the two companies have called it off. Qualcomm has been pretty determined. You saw Mullenkoff say that it's time to move on. They've waited long enough for this deal. From NXP's standpoint, it's not quite as clear because they they, they did want this deal. Um, and in his, uh, in his comments today, he said, yes, they're planning to move on. They do have a strong future as an independent company. But the two companies made the case for being together in the past. So they, you know, they, there are some opportunities there. But Chinese regulators have essentially uh, made it impossible for them to proceed at this point. All right. Bloomberg's Peter Elstrom, thanks so much. Good to have you here in town. Okay, coming up, Facebook's rough and tumble week. The social media giant is laying the blame at the feet of the European Union. We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Facebook's lackluster earnings have led to a steep drop in the social network's market value. $100 billion wiped out in a blink. It's more than the market cap of Goldman Sachs and the GDP of Slovakia. The company lost about a million of Europe's monthly active users in its rough second quarter. And CFO Dave Weiner says it's all the fault of Europe's new strict set of protection laws known as GDPR, saying, we saw the declines that we anticipated from GDPR, and I would say they're really those impacts were purely due to the GDPR impact, not other engagement trends. So does Europe fully agree? To answer that, let's head to London where Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde is standing by. So Caroline, what are European regulators, lawmakers and users saying? Disagreeing. Disagreeing. They're saying, no, look, it's not just because of the regulation, Emily. They're saying it's actually because of the mood music that has totally changed against you. You've lost faith of the regulators. You've lost faith of the users. You've lost faith of the advertisers. And that is why you're seeing people moving away from your product. I mean, when you look at it in context, they've lost a million monthly active users. They've used, lost about three million daily active users in Europe. I mean, to lose them is unheard of. But nevertheless, it, it's but a drop in the ocean when you compare it to like the two 
280 million daily of active users they have in the whole region. Nevertheless, people are saying that this is the fact that this is a first full quarter since the scandal that engulfed them surrounding Cambridge Analytica and the 87 million user data that they were able to have. And indeed, the investigations in terms of the manipulation, perhaps, of the, ele of the election of, of Facebook users by Russia, that's a key concern. And this is what is impacting the decision whether or not to use the product. Many also, though, think on the flip side, look, actually, when you came, when GDPR came into place, Facebook had to put these new privacy rules in place, and you had to rather annoyingly click through and either accept or, or move away from Facebook entirely. Well, maybe because of the whole furor around the scandal, people thought, look, I know how you use my data now. I've got more transparency, and I don't want in. Or some maybe just couldn't really be bothered to click through and, and stop browsing quite so much. I spoke with Roger McNamee, early Facebook investor, who would, I'm assuming, agree with Europe on this one. He thinks that Facebook is putting the blame on GDPR to obscure the fact that actually what's happening is that in its most profitable markets, users are saturating. There just aren't that many more new users. Could that be true? I'm, could be. We've seen growth slowing across the board in the last few quarters. This has been worried about. I mean, in Canada and the US, they don't have the same strict privacy rules, but you saw stagnation completely in new users. So maybe they've hit a tipping point. But I think also there is an extent that some analysts are saying, look, actually, this is just a blip. There's particularly one particular analyst over Richard Greenfeld is at BTIG, Emily, and he's been saying, look, the dip in users related to GDPR, if it is related related to GDPR is a one-time step down. It's not a building headwind. I'm cautious about that take. I'm, I think it's interesting because actually the GDPR headwind could in fact get worse. That's what Bloomberg analysis is saying, Bloomberg intelligence saying, look, the changes could continue to hurt because in fact what Facebook has done is said, Either you accept our new terms of privacy, you accept that when you sign up to Facebook, your data is, is distributed and we're able to target ads at you, or get off our platform, we don't, we, you can't use us at all. Now, GDPR, the General Data Protection Rules of the EU, say you actually need to accept the terms of service freely. Is it really freely accepted if you either accept them or you can't use Facebook at all, which for many is quite an important way of socializing and keeping up with friends and getting your news. So many are feeling that actually the EU come Q1 2019, as soon as that could say your privacy rules, the way you've interpreted them isn't right. We might fine you and indeed you're going to have to change them. So we could see it get even more nuanced, Emily. You could find that actually you're able to use Facebook, but they're not allowed to use your data. What then of their revenue growth? What then of advertisers? What then of targeted advertising? Fascinating, especially given that it appears from the outside, Google has perhaps benefited from GDPR because mm -hmm. they uh, were able to expend the resources to get compliant, uh, hurting some smaller competitors. Okay, Bloomberg Caroline Hyde in London. Thanks so much. Coming up, got tech earnings fatigue? Well, there's one more big tech company you got to watch, and that's Apple. We will discuss next. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. It has been a wild earnings season so far for tech with any negative sentiment sending shockwaves through the markets. Coming up Tuesday, Apple will report its results and a lot is on the line. For more, I want to bring in Jim Suva, Managing Director at Citigroup in New York and in L.A. We have Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who, of course, covers Apple for us. Mark, what is the street expecting? The street is expecting about 15 to 16 percent year-over-year revenue growth with revenue coming in between guidance around 52.5, 52.3 billion, uh, which would be the biggest growth in the June quarter, the third quarter uh, for Apple since 2015. So looking positive so far. Jim, is it all about the iPhone again? Well, the reality is Apple has started to diversify its portfolio. And part of this has been things such as the ear pods that are doing very well and still selling out after being out for over a year. The Apple Watch, which is the best selling smartwatch out there. But importantly, when it comes down to the numbers of making earnings and the most amount of money, 
you are right. It comes down to the iPhone, and you cannot underscore how important that is. The iPhone is what matters most, even though they're diversifying, but the iPhone matters the most. We expect 47 million units in September, and that's a growth from 42 million units when they report earnings on Tuesday for the June quarter. Now, Mark, how much will you be watching the iPhone 10 number in particular as a sort of marker, given the fact that, as you've reported, new phones are coming out this fall? Right. Yeah, the performance of the iPhone 10 will continue to be a, a subject uh, of interest for both analysts and investors, given the high price point and how much Apple has shown that it is banking on this product to be successful. And usually in the third quarter, we get Apple executives talking about that because of leaks and expectations of new iPhones coming, uh, that the sales will slow down a bit. That makes me think that this third quarter is typically one of the more boring quarters. Not that any are particularly boring for Apple, given it's the biggest company in the world, but it's one of the slower ones. So we'll be looking at iPhone ASP. One of the averages I saw uh, earlier this week was $690, which would be substantial growth over a low $600 ASP from the year ago quarter, which would seem to indicate the iPhone 10 is still going strong ahead of the new models uh, coming out in the September quarter. So, Jim, aside from the iPhone, what other metrics are you going to be looking at closely? Will it be Apple Music? Will it be some more information about Apple's investments in, in original content, which you know also at this point are still relatively small? Well, on the print on Tuesday night, people are immediately going to look at first iPhone units, iPhone ASPs, then earnings per share. It comes down to the company making money, and that's where people want to make money on the stock market is when companies generate more cash flow and more money. Underscoring, underscoring that EPS and that money that they're generating is gross margins. Importantly, gross margins have a lot of puts and takes. We mentioned earlier on the show about average selling prices. That's absolutely important, as is the cost of goods sold. And some of those components, such as memory prices, have started to decline. That means on the same given amount of value that Apple can actually generate more profitability. So in order of importance, iPhone units, iPhone ASPs, earnings per share and cash flow, and then gross margins. Mark, you've reported about higher end AirPods coming out. You know, as, as Jim talked about the success of the AirPods, you've also reported on over the ear headphones coming out, a, a newer HomePod. Are we going to hear any of this? You know, they're not going to really talk about it, but I think they're going to maybe play up this other segment a little bit, this other products division, along with services. And just to add uh, to, to the other guest's earlier point, I think services are going to be in that top five of things that people are going to be interested in. What investors and analysts are looking for are things beyond the iPhone, because even though the iPhone still today and tomorrow will remain the, the majority of Apple revenues, about two-thirds of the company, what we're going to start to see is growth slowing down on an annual basis to between zero and five percent annually for the next five years or so, people are going to be looking for that next big thing to show what's going to be that growth area for Apple, not in three years from now, but in five, 10, and 15 years from now. Uh, Jim, we've seen huge swings from Facebook, Twitter, and even Netflix on the back of disappointing results. Does Apple have any room for error here? Or if there is any sign of weakness, will we see massive volatility? Well, the thing that's really helping out Apple is, to be honest, is a $100 billion capital returns. That's what they already announced and they're actively doing. But also importantly, the valuation, a metric that we use on Wall Street called price to earnings, is relatively low to some of the other companies that you mentioned, which are kind of high fly or high growth. Importantly, Apple has transitioned. It's not really a growth company. It's a mature tech company. They pay a dividend, they buy back stock, those type of things set up for growth investors um, and value investors not holding the hands of growth investors. And when we look at valuation of price to earnings of say 12, 13 times earnings, it's not expensive. And then you layer on a dividend yield of two to 3% and a stock buyback of about $100 billion. We think there's valuation support should something go wrong. That being said, we see no signs of anything being derailed. Our channel checks show that the legacy iPhones are selling very well because every year Apple prices down by $100 its newest phones and its older phones. So those phones start getting cheaper and cheaper and more affordable in under other countries of the world. And these high $1,000 phones all of a sudden start to get discounted. So we actually see valuation support and we don't see the potential risk that some of the other companies that you had referenced. Right. Apple certainly much cheaper than Amazon, of course. All right, Jim Suva of Citigroup and our very own Mark Gurman. As always, thank you both.
Well, while Intel reported strong results in its second quarter, investors are skeptical. The company is searching for a new CEO after Brian Krasanich's resignation, and key potential successors have already left the company. Intel is also facing delays on developing new PC chips, which could leave an opening for competitors like AMD to get ahead. I spoke with Intel's interim CEO, Bob Swan. He's also the CFO about all of this earlier on Bloomberg Television. Well, we have a uh, set of leadership products through the end of 2018 and into 2019 that we feel very good about. And they're a function of uh, our 14 nanometer product portfolio, which we've continued to generate more and more performance out of the 14 nanometer uh, node. Um, in parallel with that, we've been investing in our 10 nanometer process technology, and we're scaling that as we go through the second half of 18 and going into 19. As we indicated yesterday, we will be uh, having products on the shelf in the second half of 19. But through that journey, we feel very good about our leadership product performance at a time when the market is really valuing high performance compute. So we feel good about where we are and we feel good about the progress we're making of late in scaling the 10 nanometer, improving the 10 nanometer yields. Now, you also said that the piece PC market is on course to grow for the first time in 2018 since peaking back in 2011. What is driving that and how long will it last? Well, the real growth we're seeing is, is somewhat widespread, particularly on the, uh, the commercial side, less, less on the consumer side, more on the commercial side, and we're seeing it across all regions, all regions of the world. So CIOs are really taking the opportunity to uh, accelerate the refresh of, of PC products at the enterprise level, and um, in doing that, they're looking for high-performance products. It's a lot allowed us to grow the PC business in the quarter by 6%. We haven't seen that kind of growth rate in the PC business in a long time. And when the PC business grows on top line, we, gener we generate tremendous profits from that business. And we're pretty excited about the demands for PC heading into the second half of the year. My colleague Ian King wrote a piece about the extraordinary female candidates as you search for a CEO. First of all, you said you don't want the job. Is that true? That's, that's according to our reporting. And what else can you tell us about how fast the search is going and who's being considered? Yeah, well, first, um, I love my day job, so I'm, uh, I'm excited for the progress that the board is making and finding the next uh, great CEO for this wonderful company. In terms of the process, the board hasn't really set a timeline, but I'd say they're moving with quite a sense of urgency, and they're looking at both uh, highly qualified internal candidates as well as external candidates, and they will uh, take the time necessary to make sure we find the ideal candidate um, and we'll have a variety of uh, considerations in picking who that person is. For our company, Emily, diversity and inclusion has been a very important part of, of the makeup of, of the company. So I'm sure one of the criteria, one of the many criteria the board will think is, the board will consider is how important diversity and inclusion is for the next leader of this company. It's been a stalwart for Intel. It's very important for our company and our culture. And I'm sure that will be one of the considerations that the board will evaluate. You do have some pretty progressive programs, which we have reported on. On the call, you did thank Brian Krasanich for his leadership. And I'm curious, you know, Intel decided that he did something, had an affair that violated company policy. What are you doing to make sure that doesn't happen again elsewhere in the organization? I mean, Intel has a strong history of uh, values and culture being extremely important. And the reality is that it applies to everybody in the organization. And we constantly reinforce that on an ongoing basis. But the ethics and the values of the company are extremely high. And our employees rally around and adhere to the policies that we have. And there's no exceptions in our company about um, who has to adhere to policies. So it's a it's a strength of the company. It always has been, and I'm confident that it always will be. The semiconductor industry has been especially vociferous in speaking out against some of these Trump 
tariffs. What's your position on the moves that the president and the administration is making in the name of America first when, you know, some of these chip companies are arguing it, it's actually hurting them? Yeah. Well, the, um, the semi-industry um, for a very long time is, in the U.S. has been a, has been a net, net exporter. Um, so the products that we design and we build here in this country and export around the world is a sig significant source of revenues, profits, and employment for U.S.-based semi-companies. So uh, we're very, um, very clear about um, our desires to see free global trade around the world because it is a contributor to our growth, to our competitiveness, and to U.S. jobs. And that's, um, that's important for the industry. It's very important for our company as well. That was some of my conversation with Intel's interim CEO and CFO, Bob Swan. You can catch the full conversation at Bloomberg.com. Coming up with midterms approaching here in the U.S., insecure and aging voting systems are on the minds of many election experts. We'll talk about why paper ballot backups could be the answer. This is Bloomberg. We're almost 100 days out from midterm elections here in the U.S., and there are already reports that Russia is attempting to hack them again. And the United States remains the only country, believe it or not, in the developed world to not have a paper backup to its electronic votes. Here to discuss, Lawrence Norton, director of the Brennan Center's Democracy Program and author of The Machinery of Democracy, Protecting Elections in an Electronic World. Now, Lawrence, we all remember the problem with paper ballots back in 2000, Bush Gore, and there have been complaints about electronic voting systems going back to 2004. Mm -hmm. What is the actual solution here? Yeah, I, in fact, the problems in the 2000 election with the hanging chads that you, you, you mentioned in, in Florida led to us to move to uh, electronic systems. And I think the answer is really what we need. Um, electronic systems, uh, whether they're scanners that read paper ballots or they're touchscreen machines, have advantages, but we need paper backup uh, so that we can ensure that what the software is telling us uh, is accurate. There are currently 21 states that have electronic voting systems and five states that have electronic voting systems with no paper trail at all. Mm -hmm. New Jersey, Delaware, South Carolina, Georgia, and Louisiana. Would you say that these states are the most at risk for being well, hacked? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that there are a number of aspects to our elections. So there are registration databases that tell us who can vote. Um, there are electronic poll books that are used in many places um, that allow people to sign in so that they can vote. Th those are also things that we have to worry about when we're talking about cyber attacks. Uh, when it comes to the voting machines themselves, and as I know what a lot of people are focused on, uh, and ensuring they're secure, it's not that um, a paperless system is necessarily easier to hack, right? Even if you're filling out a paper ballot, as we do in about two-thirds of the country, and then have that scanned in by a computer, that computer could be hacked too. But the thing that I'm worried about in, in the five states that are the, all paperless, and then there, there are another eight that uh, much of the state might be paperless, for instance, Pennsylvania, is that um, there's no way to, to check afterwards with something that's independent of the software uh, to make sure that the totals are accurate. And that's, that's a great concern and why many people who work in this space, um, and, and that includes the Department of Homeland Security and others, have recommended that these systems be replaced. Now, I know we're all focused on the tally because, you know, we want to know if, if the results could have been altered. There is no evidence that we've heard that, that the results um, in, in, in the 2016 mm -hmm. presidential election would be different if the, the, the election had not been compromised. But do you, bu do you buy that? Do we know for certain that the results you know, wouldn't have been different? Well, so here's the issue, and I, the, the discussion around um, the, the hacking and the interference in the 2016 election can get a little bit confused. I should emphasize that all of the attacks on the election infrastructure that we know about were against things like um, the registration databases, um, attempts to get into election officials' emails, things like that. Uh, I'm not aware of any, I don't think there's any public record of 
uh, any attempt to get into the voting machines themselves. No, um, no evidence of any altering of vote totals. But something that's really critical is um, part of the effort um, of, of the Russians in the 2016 election and, frankly, in, in, in attacks and interference in elections around the world has been to discredit the whole idea of democracy and trust in democracy, and I think we're going to be seeing more of that. So it does really worry me that in 2018, 2020, um, it, with social media propaganda and other things, um, if, there are, if there are doubts cast on the outcome of the election, particularly in these states where they don't have paper backup and they're not checking the paper, uh, that, that you really are leading to um, a, potentially a, just a crisis in the confidence in the electoral system in the United States, and that's really dangerous. Well, given that Congress just voted down a measure that would have uh, provided additional funding for securing mm -hmm. the vote, how confident are you about these elections that are you know, just over 100 days away? Well, I, th I think a key thing, first of all, Congress did provide about um, $380 million uh, a few months ago for upgrading election infrastructure. I think the key thing for us to focus on for the next few months um, is that if there is a successful breach of systems, and I think we have to act under the assumption that if there is a, a, an antagonistic nation state working against us, that that's a real possibility, um, that we can make sure that people can still vote and that their votes are counted. So we have paper okay. backups if something happens to the machines um, and right. that we're ready. We'll have to leave it there. Lawrence Norton, director of the Brennan Center's Democracy Program. Thanks so much for joining. Coming up, a new way to blast off how a new startup wants to change the way we enter outer space. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg's Game Changers takes a look at how a startup called Axion System is looking towards a micro-thin chip and the sci-fi sounding iron thrusters to revolutionize how we move through the final frontier. This tiny little wafer thin chip could be a better way to explore space than this. In the gold rush to space, you could say we're like the shovel. Once upon a time, Natalia Bailey had big dreams of working for NASA. I would sleep on my trampoline at night and watch the stars and thinking about aliens and watching the space station pass overhead. And I you know, went on to apply to NASA twice to become an astronaut and I've gotten the thanks but no thanks postcards from NASA, but I'll keep applying. So she had to settle for being a plain old rocket scientist and a founding member of Axion Systems, a startup poised to revolutionize space travel with these wafer-thin chips that, believe it or not, are engines. Low Earth orbit is uh, becoming more and more accessible to organizations, universities, hobbyists in their garages, people that before never would have even imagined launching a satellite. So we're talking about you know, tens of thousands of satellites being launched over the next decade, and currently they have no propulsion solution. And that's what Axion is building, is, is an ion engine that works on small satellites. OK, this is actually rocket science, so here's the bare minimum you need to know. An ion is a charged atomic particle. By pushing ionic liquid, which is basically a molten salt, into this chip the size of a penny, billions of ions can be discharged at mind-boggling velocities. If you could picture an astronaut sitting on the back of a satellite, uh, and she's throwing tennis balls off the back, uh, each time she throws a tennis ball off, the satellite moves a little bit in the opposite direction. In Axion's engine, these tennis balls are actually ions, and our smallest ion engine is about the size of a pack of cards. Now, we'll still need conventional rockets to escape Earth's gravity, but once in space, Axion's chip will increase the shelf life of satellites by years and eventually enable deep space travel without chemical propulsion rockets. Our engines operate without any fire or you know, flames or loud noises, so they're not quite as visceral as, say, a Falcon Heavy rocket, for example, but they're very efficient. This is a Burkut, uh, it's a canard pusher, uh, and it's kind of like our family car. I've always wanted to be an astronaut, and aviation is kind of like the next best thing. 
Fortunately, I married a pilot. And we're raising the youngest pilot here. The first electric propulsion engines were actually developed in the 50s and 60s, but they were largely ignored after that. And it seemed to me during college that there was this whole branch of rocket science just waiting to be advanced. Natalia's studies accelerated at such a rapid pace, she had to learn what it meant to own a business while still a student of science. I don't think business comes that naturally to me. I was in a lab at MIT trying to finish up experiments with headphones on listening to how to be a startup CEO and trying to learn on the job, essentially. Our serious long-term customers are right now people like the Department of Defense and folks like Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Uh, but our first flight delivery that went out the door was actually to Irvine High School. So a group of high school students is going to be launching a CubeSat with our system on it. After hawking these chips to everyone from school kids to the Department of Defense, Natalia envisions Axion playing an even larger role in space exploration. Shoot for Mars or... Uh, Alpha Centauri. It's pretty a uh, bee hag, a uh, big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> Is that sort of like your whole your whole career, basically? Yes. Why would you have it any other way? That's all for this Friday. We'll be back next week. This is Bloomberg.